introduce the speakers as they come along. The first speaker is a, a very old friend of mine, um, Larry Reed, um, now from the Foundation for Economic Education. He's had a tremendous, he started off as an academic, a tremendous record with think tanks, and he's um, working with FEE, which is a, a wonderful American think tank that works with um, the young up to, I think, 18 years, he'll tell you. Anyway, I can't recommend him highly enough, and um, here's Larry Reed. Okay, thank you very much, Linda. Can you hear me okay? No, no, no. Oh, sorry, I guess maybe I think they said not to touch it. Maybe I did. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. If I speak this closer to the microphone, you can hear me in the back, all right? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'm delighted to be with you, and I encourage all of you to uh, take a look at our website, fee.org. And having said that, let me uh, say a few words about what makes for a successful organization. Now, I know that others have addressed this from various angles, and our time is very limited, so I have to carefully select about four or five points that I want to share with you. Uh, not that this list is in any way complete, but it may be uh, material that is not presented by others. The first point I will touch upon ever so briefly, not because it's unimportant, it is critically important. Nothing is more important, I think, than this first issue. But I know that my friend Elena is going to talk about it in more detail, so we made an agreement whereby I would just touch on it. And that is the importance of character. If you want to be convincing, if you want to persuade others, if you want people to come to your cause, to embrace your cause, you have to exhibit the strongest, most admirable character. Your organization will, in the long run, reflect no better than your character and that of the others that you hire to work with you. Character is of critical importance. In fact, I would argue in another context that the absence of character is ultimately what we're up against, all of us who are fighting for liberty. What we're up against is the absence of character, which shows up in the form of the use of the government uh, to plunder others for personal gratification, or the seeking of power over others. That's, just, that's not just bad economics, that's bad character. But if you want to uh, uh, win over others to your cause, you better be sure that you are everything you claim to be. Uh, because it takes sometimes years to build up character, but it takes seconds to tear it down. A single bad mistake that stems from the a momentary absence of character can set you behind for years. So when I talk about character, I mean things like honesty, reliability, punctuality, patience, courage, high standards in all that we do, in our speech and in our conduct. Critically important, you cannot impart what you do not possess. People won't believe you if you don't possess it. And furthermore, empathy is part of this too. Empathy is an important character virtue. You have to show that you know not only the facts and the figures, that you're capable not only of doing a study, but that you also care about real people. And the way to remember this is an old phrase, I don't know who came up with it, but I think it's catchy and it's memorable, and that is that people don't care what you know if they don't know that you care. So when you hold a news conference, or in any context, when you're trying to persuade other people of the virtues of uh, the free society, uh, you'd better come across as not just a person who can play games with mathematics and throw out all the numbers, but who has a real empathy, a real a feeling for real people. We're for a free society, not for some abstract, uh, incomprehensible reason, but rather because we know that that's most beneficial for real people. It changes their lives for the better. It's in the context in which they can be themselves. So you've got to talk in terms of one-on-one, -on -one actual, real people, uh, and that will show in the character you possess. Uh, another element of good character, I think, is one of the many virtues, one that I 
uh, can't leave the subject without saying something about is optimism. Optimism. How many of you have met fellow lovers of liberty who, within the first five minutes of conversation, may come across as pessimistic? We're losing. We're behind. How could we ever win this? The odds and the obstacles are too great. Have you heard that from? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> well, that doesn't work. If you are pessimistic, you're not going to work very hard to begin with. And you're certainly not going to attract other people uh, to your cause. If you're pessimistic, how are you going to be contagious in any way? You want your ideas to fire people up, to get them excited, to get them to say, wow, I want to be like that. I want to read more. I want to get active on behalf of those ideas. You have to be optimistic. I'll share with you a quick story. Some of you have heard me tell this before. It was the first time in my life that I realized that my optimism was not just natural. It might, it might even be pathological. And that was in February of 1980. It was a very slippery, cold morning in Michigan. I was driving my car to work. There was ice on the highway. And someone wanted to make a left turn in front of me. And they were waiting for me to pass through. But then at the last second, they decided they had enough time. And so they turned left right in front of me. I swerved the car to miss them, lost control of the car, and ended up upside down in the ravine along the road. And as the car rolled over, I remember vividly what went through my mind. For some reason, I was serenely calm about it. I wasn't worked up at all. It didn't bother me in the slightest. I don't know why. That's not perhaps very normal. But guess what went through my mind as the car rolled over? I thought to myself, I'm going to get a new car out of this. Yeah. <laughs> and I did. Well, that's when I realized after the other guy was more shaken up than I was. But that's when I realized, wow, I guess I'm a natural optimist because I tended immediately to think of what good may come out of that uh, uh, event. If you can train yourself to be optimistic, it will show in your character, it will show in your presentations, you'll find that the philosophy you're discussing will be contagious. People want to know that they're on the winning side, that they, that they you know, whatever, whether it's, it's going to win this year or next year or who knows when, they want to know that they're not on a side that is doomed to failure. So you've got to work yourself up into a frenzy of optimism in a very friendly, diplomatic, and polite fashion, but you've got to convince people that the future belongs to liberty. Get aboard the train now. We're changing the world. It's going to happen. And do not take failure or uh, any obstacle as a reason to be deterred. Uh, another point I want to raise, oh, I, I, I tell you one last thing. Let me recommend a book for you. I know that uh, think tanks are usually recommending economics texts or studies and things like that, and they're very important. But if you want to develop the kind of character that will make friends and influence people, well then read the book that carries that very phrase in its title. Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a classic. I think it's been translated into quite a few languages. Millions of copies have been sold. It's at least 50 years old. But it has enormous numbers of tips about how to, just as the title suggests, make friends and influence people. Well, isn't that what we're all about as believers in liberty? We want to make friends. We want to influence people. So read that book and take its advice to heart and try to infuse it throughout uh, the work of your organization. Have a plan, a strategic plan. This has been touched on a little bit by Tom Palmer and maybe one or two others. Uh, so many think tank people sort of fly in all directions. Uh, they are ruled by the tyranny of the urgent. What seems to be important at the moment. They can't say no to anything because they're too eager to say yes to everything. If you have a strategic plan that's drawn from your understanding of your organization's strengths, its very narrowly focused and defined mission and vision, you have goals to establish, and uh, if you've got all that in place and you know where you're going, stick to it. That means you will have a rule book by which you can say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this because it follows the strategic plan. That way, you'll be much better organized than if you're just flying in all directions 
you've got to take time uh, to develop a plan. It's like sharpening your axe. Uh, if, if you have two lumbermen and one of them, the old story is one guy is, uh, uh, they're both chopping all day long, but one of them stops about every hour and does something, and uh, the other guy never quits. But the guy who stops every hour for a few minutes ends up chopping more wood. Why? Because during that 10 minutes every hour, he's sharpening his axe. That's a bit of a commentary on the importance of a plan and, uh, uh, and following uh, a design that will make you productive all the time. How am I on time? I'm not very good chairman. I have watched but I, I I'm, I, I'm not a very good chairman. I'm listening, not looking at my watch. But I'll advise a time at which you started and make a unilateral decision about when you have to stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, a couple other points. Develop good relations with your media. Don't assume from the start that the media people are your enemy. Get to know them on a first day basis. When we started the Mackinac Center in Michigan about 25 years ago, my, one of my goals in my first year was to try to visit with at least two editors or reporters every week. That didn't always happen. But at the end of that first year, I met many dozens of editors and reporters. And it makes all the difference in the world. If they've gotten to know you face to face, and then uh, some status comes by sometime and meets with them and tries to trash you, you know, a thinking, decent person will say, wait a minute, I met, I met Larry. He didn't bite. He seemed like a reasonable person. He took time out to see me. You've got to be more than just a distant outfit that sends paper out the door. You've got to be an organization of real people who know other real people. That includes people in the media who may not uh, personally agree with you. A minute left, okay. Finally, uh, think big. I'm convinced that a lot of our groups uh, uh, within libertarian circles don't think big enough. You know what I mean. You know, we, we go meet with somebody, we ask them for $500, they could give us 50,000, but we never have the courage to ask for something big. Uh, you need to talk to people in terms of the magnificence of, the, of your project and the end goal. Uh, end with a quick example of um, a man that we approached once for our first million dollar gift. Now this is an extraordinary case, not going to happen very often, but it's, it illustrates the point. We had identified a longtime supporter who had given us 10, 15, 50,000 maybe at the most in any given year. We identified him as the, the guy who could give us a million dollars and be our first million dollar donor. So we rehearsed how this was going to go. This was a guy that when you met with him, you, you never had a short meeting. It always took quite a while, so we were prepared for the afternoon. But my development director said, Larry, you know this guy best, so you have to make the case. Don't give it back. And by that he meant, you know, if he's quick to resist, don't be quick to say, oh, uh, well, we'll be happy with whatever you can do. We know he has it. We know he shares the vision. Uh, press him as far as you reasonably can. So we spent the first half hour just talking generally, and then we got to the point where I had to make the ask, and I said, Mr. Morey, I have a request of you. You're a very special person. You're what we call a true believer. You support us not just because it's good for your bottom line, for our economy in this state to be free, but because you're thinking long term, your children and their children. Not many people think that way. You're very special to us, so therefore, I would like to make a special request of you. Will you become our first one million dollar donor? And there was silence, just like this. <laughs> it seemed like for an eternity. And then I could tell he was getting angry. And the first thing he finally said was, you want a million dollars? <laughs> now that's the, that was the first chance where I could have given it back. I could have said, oh, is that too much? Sorry, uh, we'll settle for 10,000. No, <laughs> but no, I said, yes, that's absolutely right. Our work is so critical, the future of our state depends upon it. No one else is doing it. We are the truest advocates of liberty in our state. That's why you support us. We're making the situation for your grandchildren far sunnier far rosier 
that would be the case if we weren't here. You know what we can do. Just think what we can do with a million of it. And if you do that, think of the other people we can go to and leverage your gift and say, Mr. Mori was the first. He did it because he believes in us. And uh, on and on. And uh, anyway, he, he was angry for the first hour. But I kind of stuck with it, and I could tell we were wearing him down. <laughs> and finally, here's what he said, and I'll leave you with this. Finally, he blew me away. He looked at me and he said, well, I, I think I can do three million. <laughs> <laughs> well, what he ended up doing was he gave, he gave us a million dollars in a, what is called a promissory note on, in a, on deposit at a bank with terms that for the first 20 years, the bank would just give us the interest at a certain 1% below prime every quarter. And then after the first 10 years, that uh, million dollars would be paid out 10% a year over the next. So it was a 20 year thing. And in his, his mind, he was sort of adding up all the annual amounts and saying, well, that's about a $3 million gift. But in any event, uh, if we hadn't thought big, We'd have walked out of there with another $50,000 check, not a $1 million check. Think big, the cause is worth it. There are, are few things on this planet that are more noble than the cause that people will be free. Rise to the standards and rise to the lofty measure of that very lofty goal. Thank you. Well, well,